Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, I'm going to talk yeah, a little bit about some work I've done with VR over the years and how these have influenced my um, um, opinion of this concept of presence. Um, but I'll first apologise right from the beginning for running out of time, yeah, because it's almost sure I will. I have uh, this last time I, I presented these slides, uh, I think it took about an hour. So what I'll do is skip every second slide and we'll race through. Okay. Um, okay. Um, a little bit about myself. I've been working with um, VR related technologies for quite a while. But predominantly in the, at the crossroads of art and uh, academia um, at the University of Sydney. And that's mainly what I'll talk about today, the, the work I did there. So it was um, a research lab between the com Faculty of Computer Science and the School of Fine Art. And we were devoted to exploring the artistic possibilities of immersion and interaction. Um, this... I'm going to start. This this is a really old work. This is the first work we did in Sydney in 2004. And I, I've never spoken about this publicly because it's never really been of much interest until recently. Suddenly it's become uh, quite relevant. Um, so it's quite at least it's, it's over 10 years old. Uh, it was with head-mounted displays, um, some very old ones. And the work concerns um, a man called Ronald Ryan who escaped from a prison in Melbourne in 1965, yeah. And during the prison break, one of the guards was fatally shot. And later when Ryan was caught, he uh, was found guilty, despite um, there being conflicting witness accounts of what happened and whether he was the one who fired the fatal shot. And then he was hanged, and he was the last man hanged in Australia in 1967. So what happens in this work is the, the viewers first witness a simulation, a reenactment of the, the prison break, which is presented to them as a um, panoramic stereo video. Yeah? Um, they watch the outbreak, they hear the shots and everything. It's all happening around them. They're placed very much in the middle of it. And after this, they're transported into a virtual world where they see the other users and they can talk to them and they can see them move. And in this world, they get to discuss things, and they also get to interact with um, characters from Ronald Ryan's life. We had a, a bunch of scripted, you know, semi-autonomous characters uh, captured in video um, that would come and, and talk with the characters. It was quite technically ambitious, I must say, for 2004. It had, um, just so you know, uh, 8K resolution panoramic stereo video which we play back in real time with our own codex. Um, and on top of that, um, a lot of work with um, spatial audio. Um, so of course now it's normal to use this head-related transfer function stuff to spatialize audio. Back then it was quite difficult to spatialize uh, enough sounds in real time to really create a rich soundscape. So we had to develop techniques to um, pre-bake a, a lot of this into um, into hundreds of sounds for each of the directions. It also had voice recognition and it had um, special um, codecs for transmitting voice over the internet that could then be spatialized because it was very important that you could hear where people were talking from. And it turns out that uh, certainly at the time, the codecs you use to transmit voice strip away a lot of information that's not necessary for understanding but is necessary for spatialization. So the higher frequencies, the lower frequencies you need for your ears to, to, uh, to localise the sound. Um, the work, i just skip over this. I wasn't sure if this would be a technical conference. I'm going to skip some of the technical stuff. Um, the work was intended, I'll talk about this because it's quite interesting in terms of journalism. It was intended to highlight the, the problems of the false sense of certainty that you can get from a first-person point of view and the impossibility of, a, of certainty also that comes from a first-person point of view. So either people would come out of it saying, I was sure this is what happened, or people would come out of it and say, I just couldn't tell what happened. I was looking this way and I heard the shot and I looked this way. People would have very mixed uh, uh, results. But in either case, it was impossible to be certain. We had set it up so it was ambiguous. Multiple shots were fired. Um, we don't know. And I think... Um, you know, I, we wanted to highlight the potentially sub, subversive uh, elements of immersive media. Yeah, 
you're going to be putting people into situations where they have very real reactions to things, but there is nothing to say that their feeling of authenticity is necessarily the case. Um, and last night, in fact, just last night, I read the C a quote from the CEO of this uh, company, Jaunt, who are making these cameras, a big company, these panoramic cameras, and he said, VR is truly objective, right? which just struck me as the exact opposite of the way I feel. VR is truly subjective. This is the very point of it. You're giving someone an extremely subjective experience on many levels. Not only you have no longer any control over what they will experience, but it's an extremely personal experience. Yeah? And in fact, the power of images before could be attributed more to their control of objectivity. You're controlling more with images. Here in VR, you must relinquish all. So I'm not, I feel very much the opposite. And I think issues of truthfulness and f uh, fidelity and, and, and you know, these faithfulness to, to things are going to become really important as we start to immerse people in things and saying to them, hey, this is how it was. This is going to affect journalism, it's going to affect documentaries, it's going to affect um, history of museums. Um, we've had a strange and very conveniently easy relationship with the notion of truth with just images. For some reason, if it's captured by a camera, we have we, up, up until the invention of CG, but even now when you watch things on the news, you assume, well, this is how it was. The cameras we use in VR, as you've seen, will very rapidly go from just panoramic cameras to 3D scanners to uh, hybrid constructions of 3D with video. Um, and the notion of this is how it was, um, we won't have this easy relationship anymore. It's very important um, to think. And I don't know if we're going to come up with some... We are going to have to come up with some idea of how we communicate uh, what is the fidelity of this data and what is the fidelity of, of these things. Okay, this was actually the only head-mounted display project we did. It was, too, it was premature to use this technology and the rest of our work concentrated more on uh, projection environments. This is a spherical projector. Um, but our main work was a panoramic projector projection system, this is stereo. And the advantage of this um, was it was multi-user, so you could put multiple people in there and then it was a very much a social experience and you're, you were physically embodied in there. This is one of the challenges, of course, you see now with VR is you're lacking your body and this is an enormous uh, uh, factor in, in your sensation of being there. Um, of course, this was a completely different immersive experience to helmets. It was, I would even just call it semi-immersive. But um, it allowed us to explore a lot of the same things that you will be exploring with head-mounted displays um, now. And I'll quickly run through a, a, a few of them. We, of course, had um, very simple things where we, we developed our own panoramic cameras and we were able to show panoramic films, um, which we, we used for theatrical works. We worked with the Worcester Group in, in New York for, for a piece and with a, a theatre group in Melbourne uh, to make a piece. Um, and we also did some work with virtual archaeology. So this is... Um, here you've got very high-quality photographic stereo backplates. This is of Angkor Wat. Um, and we've done other works in, in uh, India and China. And then CG is composited on top to... Uh, to uh, bring the, the images to life. This one's not interactive, but later works, the CG was interactive. Um, now, the experience of being in this theatre when you're showing 3D images is quite interesting. The, the, the screen disappears, tangibly disappears, and you feel as if you're in a space extending out, except for these two strange circles, which is the ground and the one hanging above you, um, which... I don't know, they look like a magic carpets or something. Um, the system we, we used, um, we used this effect very well with um, pure 3D real-time uh, experiences. This is a training simulator for miners. This was our, one of our only commercial projects where the miners would train and, um, and, and experience um, very difficult conditions. We were able to simulate the sounds and everything of the mine. Um, and again, issues of fidelity and faithfulness become very important when you do these kind of things. Um, but more of our artistic projects were, were like this one. This is a, um, an interactive narrative where people interact with virtual characters. They have a certain amount of artificial intelligence 
and you move around. There's tracking systems that can see where you are and the characters interact with you. Um, you can find, I'm sorry, I'm going to fly through these. You can find more of this on, uh, online, of course. And then there are experiments with immersive databases. Um, this is a large database of um, TV clips. And this is also, I guess, a little bit interesting to um, this, this current conversation about how to present um, journalistic information. Here, this is just regular television content that we cut up into 20,000 clips, and you could search through it. And it's true that having an immersive space does give you um, the ability to take in an enormous uh, a bandwidth of information very quickly. For example, if you ask someone to, say, find the image with the telephone, with 500 videos playing around you, you can do it almost instantly. And on a single screen, that would take you some time, I think. On the other hand, um, this was very much an emotive experience to be surrounded by this field of, you know, infinite field of video. But um, to say that this form of data mining, I say, let me say, it's a complicated subject. I have, uh, I have my. Um, hesitations about immersive data visualization. There's very much this idea, and a lot, a lot of work has gone into it, that if you put people in data, they'll somehow see things differently. But I think this is, a, um, this is really interesting, and I think there, there are certain things to explore, but if you think about it, it kind of is it's counter to the whole scientific revolution, which over the last 500 years, which was to abstract and to remove yourself from the first-person point of view. And in fact, most of our scientific breakthroughs come from removing yourself from the first-person point of view. Um, the challenge for all this work, and a lot of universities over 20 years have spent a lot of uh, effort on immersive visualization, the challenge is uh, to make a true scientific discovery in one of these systems, you know? And I'm, I'm not aware of one yet, where someone said, we discovered something in this data that we didn't we couldn't have done on a screen looking at graphs or whatever. I, I may be wrong, I would love to be corrected. I just don't know of one yet. Um, um, and finally, just to return to the, uh, the a, a final work, I won't have time to go. It's, uh, this was the most more uh, work I did with some artists in Marseille, Jean-Michel Briere and his team, where we took a large um, archive of filmic material that um, he had made over the years, mainly in Africa, concerning the myth of Action and Diana. Um, which I won't go into here. And the, the idea was to work with the theme of, you know, Action being devoured by his own dogs um, by using just the films as the elements, the, cons the elements to build a virtual world. So everything in the virtual world, which would be 3D, real-time, procedural, completely random, um, would be made out of film, yeah? Um, so we constructed this huge... Um, organic shape that is constantly moving um, and you can't see in this image but it's made up of thousands of films yeah I'll show you a video if we have time and then the essential experience is to travel through this structure and along and around it and within it um, here you can see some images this is a photograph in the panoramic system um, it's very the, the images are very dark I apologize um, and you're constantly in motion through this thing. And what it turns out in this theater is you can induce the sense of vection, which is that you're really moving just with the visual field. Um, and this is what we play with. In fact, I could jump to a video just to show you what I mean. Um, I'll go through these images quite quick. And... There is sound, but you can't hear it. Look, I tell you what, at the end of the talk, if I have time, I'll, I'll, I'll put it back on and we, we can return to it. And I'll, I'll explain this work a little bit as I go forward um, with the rest of the talk. Um, you can see some here. Now, the, I just, just before I go on to this question of presence, it's in, important to note that this panoramic form 
um, exists from the earliest days of cinema. We heard a bit, a bit about the history. But from um, very much from the invention of cinema, the project of virtual reality was, was at the for forefront. In fact, of course, this is one of the famous arguments, is that no ordinary cinema, traditional cinema, is born from the VR project. The first cinematic experiments were more like this after they developed the basics. This is uh, 1896. Um, you have the Lumiere brothers already thinking about how to do it in color and stereo here, very early, 1900. Um, the famous one by uh, Grimoire Saint-Saëns, where he filmed with panoramic cameras in a hot air balloon, a flight above Paris, and then reprojected in enormous reconstruction like this. And Auguste Baron, um, the, this one had not only color and moving images, but panoramic sound as well. He had worked out how to record panoramic sound, but I'm not sure this one was built. I couldn't find a record of it. I show these because um, it's, it's important to note that this panoramic uh, turn is very old, uh, of course. Um, and it's also interesting to see how radical the experiments were and how grand they were before the strictures of a format the format of cinema came and the core and the commercialization of cinema and everything. Um, you know, so there will be hopefully uh, days of VR. I mean, we're going to have this also. There will be formats that come very quickly on us in VR, distribution channels and hardware that will tie us to, to which is good in certain respects because then we can develop the content focusing on that in particular. But the early days of what is possible really outside these limits, um, we should enjoy also. Um, and also, uh, uh, it's interesting to note that the, the panoramic um, direction towards VR, and these were very much attempts at VR. If you read all their, um, their statements by all the creators, their attempts were to place someone somewhere. Yeah? These, and it was essentially a, f a failure in some respect. It, it didn't place you there. And there are a number of reasons for that that hopefully I'll get to. Um, Okay, so this question of presence, what is it? It's important. Um, what is it exactly? So first of all, I'll say um, the one that concerns me, I'm, there are many types of presence we could talk about. We could talk about narrative presence, social presence, and, um, and sense of agency, whatever. But let's just start with something very basic, which is the, the perception of being in a space. Yeah? Um, now, the first thing to note, of course, is presence is much a continuous, unwavering feature of being in the real world, yeah? So this is the presence we know, and this is the standard, really, by which we, we're going to measure presence in VR. Um, it becomes really only obvious, actually, when it's disrupted. It's, um, and it's interesting to note that um, lack of presence does occur in the real world. There are psychiatric disorders. Uh, for example, there's one called depersonalization disorder, which, if I quote Seth, is a common description given by patients that their conscious experience of the self and the world has an as-if character. The objects of perception seem unreal and distant or unreachable as if behind a mirror or a window, which very much ex sounds to me like any experience I've had in VR, to be honest. <laughs> it's, it's, un it's distant, you know, except when this presence thing clicks in and suddenly it's not distant, it's within my grasp. It's there, you know. Um, so a lot of the early work on presence comes from failures of presence in real-world situations, um, but it wasn't generally uh, thought of in that way. Um, what we're trying to do then, if we say if we're present in the real world, the project in VR is to recreate this real-world presence in VR. This, I will return to at the end of the talk, is not what I believe, but it's a starting point. Right? So one way of doing that is to completely simulate the world, Yeah which, of course, is very difficult, so let's forget about that. Um, another one is to... Um, I'll skip through this one, it's going to be quick. So we can figure out these are technical ways, but really the most important thing is to simulate our perceptual relationship with the real world. Yeah? This is really what we're talking about. But nonetheless, our perceptual relationship with the real world, real world is a very complicated thing. The idea behind presence is that there are only certain facets of our perceptual relationship with the real world that we need to capture. Yeah, um, this could say I would call the the weak idea. This is the the weak idea that 
we, there are only certain things that are important. If we get those, then we're going to feel like we're there, you know. But really what most people are kind of researching and searching for is that there are certain facets of our relationship with the world that give us presence for all people and for all possible situations. And this is a much stronger idea and I believe unattainable. I mean, for a very simple example is um, there will be certain situations where whether you feel hot or cold is extremely important for your sense of presence and many situations where it's not, you know. That's one. Um, so the interfaces and the things are, are going to be, um, they're going to define the kinds of things we can make people feel present in. A much more uh, vague uh, area is what does it mean for pers different people, right? We really don't know um, how different people would react to, um, to different stimuli. A uh, good question is, um, is it more easily to feel pre uh, immersed in something you know very well from the real world? Or is it easier if you've never seen the place? I don't even know the answer to that, actually. It would be a good question. Um, so we're trying to recreate this perceptive relationship with the world. We're hoping that only certain facets of this relationship are necessary. And in my experience, and my, my, what I think, these are, the, these are the features of perception that need to be captured. Okay? Um, and I'll quickly just list some of the interesting things about this. Um, the first one, active perception, is of course the foundation of head-mounted displays. It's the observation that when we see, we're constantly moving. Um, and vision is based on a constant motion through the world. Yeah? More technically, I like to say that the, the, the light around us has many dimensions. Yeah? Not just the uh, angles of light coming through, but also you know, have the positions X, Y, Z, the angles, the wavelengths. And our visual system is picking up on changes and structure in all the dimensions. When you show a regular image, you're stripping away all the dimensions except two. Yeah? Um, and normally, because you have a frame, you're not actually exploring outside that. You're seeing them all in one go, so you're stripping away all the dimensions. In VR, the idea is to let people explore all these dimensions of vision. Um, I'll get to this why this is very important in this thing, but you, you can see here this, this is kind of puts it in a very, this is a very well known idea in, in perception, and Gibson writes about it a lot, but also many other people. Uh, and I take very much a, a Gibsonian kind of point on this. Um, I'd like to use this analogy that I've used before. Um, so, motion and action and perception are not separate things, they are one and the same. And the best way to imagine this is this device here. It's called the centrifugal governor. They used to use it to regulate the speed on steam engines. And as the engine would go faster, this device would spin. The wheels would go up, right, because of the centrifugal force. That would pull a lever to slow the engine, which would lower the, the wheels, which would slow the, slow the engine, right? And then the important thing here is there's no difference between the perception of the speed and the, and the action on the speed. It's one and the same. The movement of the ball is both. And this is very much what we're doing with our body. You know? Our movement in response to our visual thing is the act of perceiving the visual world. You know? And um, it's very much at play um, when you manipulate objects, if you tactilely feel objects. You know? um, these are the degrees of freedom you have just with vision. Okay, there are 10 degrees of freedom you're normally exploring all the time. You can move your eyes around. And this is a way of classifying the different VR systems. So we're talking about, you know, what is VR, what isn't. Um, well, one way of classifying VR systems is simply how many degrees of freedom does it allow you to explore? Yeah? Cinema, uh, panoramic cinema, where you can only move around, gives you two degrees of freedom. So it is a, a, a restricted sense of presence, you know. Um, 3D worlds allow you to explore all the dimensions. Head-mounted displays don't give you everything yet because you still must focus on the screen. So you're missing still some degrees of freedom, which might be very important, but we're not sure exactly how important it is to the sense of presence. Um, so that's one way of thinking about immersive systems. You can do how many degrees of freedom does it give you? And you can see this in works like Jeffrey Shaw where he he gives viewers degrees of freedom, different varying degrees of freedom to explore the world and therefore varying degrees of immersion. Um, I've just 
to contrast this with images, um, I, I showed this the other day. Um, when you're watching a, a regular image on a TV like this, it's, there's a strange feature of it where you feel like what you see is this, the image, yeah? It's occupying your attention, yeah? Um, and you're inattentive of everything around you. Um, but what your body is in effect seeing, everything that is revealed by active perception, right, is this. In fact, there is nothing revealed in the image by active perception. It's just everything else. And this is in a sense what your body is perceiving, but we are somehow suppressing, yeah? This is the, one of the big differences about what's going on. Um, and I think this has imp very important ramifications for how you respond to things, but I won't have time to talk about that. Um, I won't talk about perceptual invariance, but I will talk about this. The, this is, for me, probably the most important thing um, um, about what we have to recreate when we put people in VR is, pardon me, is um, perceptual binding. And this is um, the fusing of all the various stimuli you get from your eyes, your ears and everything all into a coherent, singular perceptions. Yeah? Now, of course, binding permeates um, human perception and it occurs across different senses and it ranges, ranges from really basic feature integration, so shape and colour are bound together, um, location at the lowest level, all the way up to conscious experience, which is this experience of a single world, seamless um, at the highest level. Um, now, of course, saying binding is important to perception, it's, it's a little bit like saying trees are important to the forest. You know, it's, it is what perception is. Um, but what's interesting is VR reveals a lot about binding because suddenly we're presented with stimuli that never occur in the real world. You know, objects that don't make sounds or objects that you can move but you can't feel. You know, so lacking uh, of and, and, and or conflicting things where the sound is coming from you and the object is coming from you. Things that almost never occur in the real world. And so suddenly these um, failures of binding are becoming very apparent. In my experience, through all my work, it's these failures of binding which are ruining, uh, are destroying presence. Um, it's also interesting to note that most of what we know about bindings in the real world are also from psychological disorders. Um, agnosias, uh, whatever, pros I could name them, a balance syndrome. Um, so another way of thinking about your experience in VR is you are temporarily giving users a form of, um, a form of uh, sensory motor disorder. Yeah? I mean, we're never, until you can perfectly recreate everything, you are giving them a sensory motor disorder. Um, that's one way to think about it. Uh, um, so the most important binding to presence is, of course, the binding of all the cues that come from motion and all the cues that come uh, that should be uh, elicited from that motion. Yeah. So all the internal cues that come from moving, your proprioceptive cues, your efferent copy. This is your mo mo muscle feedback back to your brain, saying to your brain what you've just done, how you've moved. All your life, these signals have been matched with very particular visual cues or sonic cues that match that and they've always been bound together and when you see the world you see the fusion of these two the fusion of your physical cues and the visual cues when in VR you get that wrong you the, the binding is broken and presence is lost and maybe you also feel very sick it also explains a little bit why latency is so critical to VR because bindings are temporal in phenomena if you miss a short window they fail to bind yeah. So you have to get the cues within a short window, then you can bind. But knowing that VR is about binding is very interesting because there are thresholds. For example, the ventriloquism effect is you can put a sound uh, away from the, the visual effect, right? Someone speaking and the voice, and you can put up to 30 degrees and the brain will move the sound and bind them and perceive them as one. And this is how ventriloquism works. Yeah. And it turns out all binding has thresholds to work with. And these are what we have to explore. How far off does the physical touch of something have to be from the vision before we can before the body will see it as one? You know, this is this is what you have to work with. Binding is also interesting because when you have cues missing, the brain I mean, it will either fail to bind or it will make up information sometimes. Um, you will hear things that didn't have any sound. 
I was trying something the other day with a hand tracker in VR at a, another conference where I was manipulating the objects and sometimes I swore I could feel it, you know. So there will be some cross-sensory enhancement going on. Um, but I think it's when you provide a sense of touch that can't be bound because it's too far from what you're used to seeing that you have this conflict. We did a uh, test a uh, uh, project at Morian with the sun shining and we put a heat lamp to simulate the heat from the, the lamp. Um, but the heat lamp was here, right? And you're very, you can very easily sense that it's close because the fall off in heat radiation is very, very quick. Yeah? So it's very hot here and not here. So it felt very close. But when you looked at the sun, it, lo it looked distant. And the, the, the result was felt like I was seeing two sources of heat. I could see one in the distance and I could definitely feel one here. And they were not connected. I don't know what the threshold has to be. I don't know. But that's what we have to explore with this thing. Um, there is a theatre group that have used this concept of presence very effectively. Um, crew from Belgium. Um, here you see they show them just panoramic videos. Um, but they manipulate them physically to make sure everything that they're seeing is, is, is met with the correct physical posture and uh, sensations. Um, you can hear, hear, see here some wonderful images of manipulating touch. Here they're tilting them back and everything to match the video. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is, to, to wrap that up, conflicts are the flip side to binding. Perceptual conflicts are the things that are going to break your binding. Yeah? This is what you have to avoid. More than realism. So, realism is secondary. It's, it's um, one path. If you can make it totally realistic, then you are inherently reducing conflicts. Yeah? But we can't make it totally realistic. So, concentrate on your perceptual conflicts. Yeah? This is the thing. Um, the bindings are not just about the body. However, they, they permeate everything, the way light shines off. This is very commonly ha happens that um, in VR, the lighting looks odd. In images, it looks fine. But with motion, when you can see the structure of the surface, it feels like now the lighting is incorrect. And this, is, this is an example. These two images on the screen look perfectly fine. In VR, one is completely wrong. It looks like there's two surfaces because the lighting is not correct. OK. Uh, that's the project I was just describing with Morian we did where we had the heat lamp um, and the dis discrepancy between the sun and the heat lamp. And uh, also we noticed another thing that helped here, we, we flew the chair through a, a, a virtual forest um, and we found that when you move people through the virtual world and you can physically feel that you're grounded, you're standing and this is one of the strongest sensations you have, for, I mean, you're grounded, but in the virtual world you, had, you, you didn't perceive that you were moving, um, the sense of vection, or the sense that you were actually moving was, was somehow broken. And we found it helped enormously to, in the virtual world, put a platform underneath you that moved with you. Because then you could bind, you could bind my perception of something that is underneath me with the sensation, my physical sensation that there's something underneath. Um, and we found that helps the sense that you're really moving. Um, Perceptual conflicts will have a big impact with AR more than VR because there the challenge is much harder. You have to fit things into the real world which you don't have control over. Yeah? Um, and this, this project by Cardiff and Miller, I don't know if you, any of you saw it at Documenta, is a wonderful example of, of, of immersion achieved through uh, avoiding perceptual conflict. Here they filmed the work in the station and ask the viewers to walk around with a small screen and simply copy the motion of the camera that they see. And it turns out to be very easy to do. You can, you can match it almost exactly. And they've recorded the soundtrack with uh, spatial headphones that you then wear. And as you walk through, you're hearing, it's very much a, a sonic work, you're hearing exactly the cues uh, that happened at that place. And because you combine them perfectly to the perceived geometry and the perceived layout of everything around you, they, you truly hear things to be coming from where they are. It's the most spatial, immersive experience, actually, I've had, to be honest, and the most techni technologically lo-fi. Matthew? Yes, time's up. Uh, time's up. I'm really, really sorry to be doing this. Um, but, yeah, we need to move on in the program a little bit. Okay. Do, do you have a concluding I remark will. just I at will. the end? A concluding remark. 
I will. Um, here we go. Next slide. Here we go. Um, I started by saying we want to replicate the, um, your perceptive relationship with the world. Okay? But in fact, we are constantly adapting to n different perceptual relationships with the world. When you put on glasses, okay? you have a different sensory motory perceptual relationship with the world that you must adapt to, and you adapt very quickly. Yeah? Riding a bike is also a different way yeah? of, of perceptually relating to the world. And in fact, you can adapt to very extreme conditions. This, this is the famous inverted vision glasses. You, put in the, you wear mirrors, the world is flipped upside down. In the first hour, you are helpless. Yeah? Um, but within an hour, you're starting to adapt and you're starting to be able to move. Within three days, people are walking about and even riding bicycles. Yeah? You can think of this very much as a head-mounted display in which you've got, your <laughs> you've, just, you've got things wrong, right? This is a head-mounted display and it, it, you have a different sensory motor relationship to the world. Um, and you must remember that every time you, whenever we put people in imperfect VR, they will adapt to it and you, they will always be adapting to it. And at first, I don't know, how, I don't know whether the ramifications of this, but I'm sure in time we will explore this and invite and create completely alien perceptual relationships with the world. There's actually no reason that we should be replicating exactly the way we relate with the world. Yeah? So, there we go.